In this video, we're going to cover DNA repair. For an individual organism to survive and reproduce, it must be genetically stable. So genetic changes or mutations must be kept to a minimum. Accurately copying the genetic information is not the only mechanism to avoid DNA changes. Cells also have a variety of complexes that monitor and scan the entire genome for DNA damage and fixes it when it happens. This is known as DNA repair, and we're going to break down some of the few mechanisms cells use to repair DNA damage. Now, if you haven't seen the previous lecture on DNA replication, I highly suggest watching that first because it connects with this one. If you have seen it, let's do a quick recap anyway on DNA replication because it's a phenomenal process. Okay, so a molecule of DNA consists of two long polynucleotide chains and they run in opposite directions. To begin replication, helicase unwinds the parental double helix. It's going to split the DNA and molecules of single strand binding proteins bind and stabilize the single stranded DNA. The unwinding of the double helix causes tension ahead of the replication fork. So the enzyme DNA topper isomerase relieves the built up tension ahead of replication forks by breaking and rejoining the DNA strands, okay? DNA topper isomerase is going to go on top of the DNA to relieve tension. To start the replication process, primase adds RNA bases called a primer. Pink primase primes DNA synthesis. DNA polymerase then binds to the primer and the leading strand is synthesized continuously in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And for the lagging strand, it's synthesized discontinuously. A primer is needed for each fragment. DNA polymerase can only synthesize in one direction, from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. And so the lagging strand is synthesized in a series of fragments called Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase adds nucleotides to the primer until it reaches the next RNA primer and then detaches. And the next fragment is primed and then DNA polymerase comes in to add nucleotides. The RNA primers are then removed by nuclease and another DNA polymerase known as repair polymerase or DNA polymerase 1 comes in to fill the gap. And then finally, DNA ligase comes in to seal all the fragments of the lagging strand and on the leading strand, it's going to join the final nucleotide to the first nucleotide and we produce a continuous DNA strand. Another important thing is that telomeres form the ends of a chromosome. These repeated sequences are needed for the ends of chromosomes to be fully replicated. Otherwise, the lagging strand would become shorter with each round of replication and the chromosomes would shrink after several cell divisions and we'd lose genetic information. Okay, that's DNA replication. Let's now subtract complexity and go through the mechanisms cells use to repair DNA damage. Okay, so there are many chemical reactions that can occur in our DNA that cause DNA damage in cells, such as thermal collisions with other molecules, exposure to reactive metabolic byproducts, chemicals, or radiations. Let's go through a few changes that can happen. These include depurination and deamination. Depurination includes the removal of a purine base from a nucleotide. It can remove guanine or adenine from DNA, and we're left with a sugar phosphate. We're not breaking the phosphodiester backbone, but simply removing a purine base. Now, if depurination is uncorrected, it can lead to the loss of a nucleotide pair. Here's another way to look at this. When the replication machinery comes to a missing purine on the template strand, it can skip to the next complete nucleotide. So we've produced one daughter molecule with no missing nucleotide pair, and the other is missing a GC nucleotide pair, okay? Another reaction is called deamination, which is the loss of an amino group from cytosine in DNA, and we produce the base uracil. Recall uracil is not normally found in DNA, it's found in RNA, but deamination can occur on other bases as well. If this is left uncorrected, a substitution of one base for another will occur. So in this case, guanine has been changed to adenine. So depurination and deamination are common chemical reactions that can occur in our DNA. And if left unrepaired, DNA damage leads either to the substitution of one nucleotide pair for another, or it leads to the deletion of one or more nucleotide pairs in the daughter DNA strand 
after replication. So these chemical changes produce mutations. Now, there are also some types of damage such as thymine dimers. The thymine dimer is formed when covalent linkage occurs between two adjacent pyrimidine bases, and ultraviolet radiation in sunlight can cause this. It damages DNA, which promotes the formation of the thymine dimer. And this type of DNA damage can stop the DNA replication complex or machinery at the site of the damage. DNA can also be changed by replication itself. When DNA is copied, incorrect nucleotides can sometimes be put in and it's not corrected during proofreading. Mistakes do happen. Proofreading is something that we covered in the previous lecture. But for each of these types of DNA damage, our cells have a mechanism for repair. Let's go through this. For mismatched nucleotides, the cells have a system in place called mismatch repair. <laughs> okay, it's in the name, mismatch repair. We have the parent DNA molecule here, Okay, DNA replication occurs. For one strand, it's replicated correctly, and for the other, there's an error in the newly synthesized strand. The cell has mismatch repair proteins that are able to detect the DNA mismatch and replace the incorrect nucleotide on the newly synthesized strand using the original parent strand as its template. This mechanism restores the correct sequence. The errors must be corrected to avoid mutations. Incredible how this works. In humans, mismatch repair plays an important role in preventing cancer. Inherited predispositions to certain cancers are caused by mutations in genes that encode mismatch repair proteins, okay? And human cells have two copies of these genes, one from each parent. If an individual inherits only one copy of this damaged mismatch repair gene, they are unaffected until the undamaged copy of the gene is randomly mutated. Okay, if a cell is deficient in mismatch repair, the chances of it becoming cancerous increase. Okay, that's mismatch repair. Let's go through another DNA repair system called nucleotide excision repair. The cool thing about the double helical structure of DNA is it has two copies of the genetic information, one in each strand. So if something happens to the sequence in one strand, we have a backup version, the undamaged strand. Here we have a beautiful DNA molecule, and then the top strand is damaged, this right here. The first step that happens is the damaged DNA is recognized and removed. There are a variety of mechanisms that do this. These involve nucleases. Nucleases cleave the covalent bonds that join the damaged nucleotides to the rest of the DNA strand, and we're left with a small gap. Think that we've removed a tooth. <laughs> Nuclease is the tool dentists use to remove a tooth. Then in the next step, a repair DNA polymerase comes in to bind the three prime hydroxyl N of the cut DNA strand. And it then fills in the gap by making a copy, a complementary copy of the information present in the other strand. This strand here that's undamaged. And once the repair DNA polymerase has filled in the gap, there's a break in the sugar phosphate backbone of this newly repaired strand. And so this break, this tiny gap is sealed by DNA ligase. Recall that DNA ligase is the same enzyme that joins the Okazaki fragments during replication of the lagging DNA strand, okay? This is what occurs in DNA repair. Let's do a quick recap before we move on. So we start with a beautiful DNA molecule. In step one, the damaged DNA is cut out by a nuclease. This step is usually known as excision, removing the damage. Then in step two, the original DNA sequence is restored by a repaired DNA polymerase, which fills in the gap or planting a new tooth, <laughs> okay? And then DNA ligase seals the tiny gap in the sugar phosphate backbone of this newly repaired strand. And energy is needed to remake the broken phosphodiester bond between the adjacent nucleotides, all right? So we've covered how damage to one strand of DNA can be repaired because we have the other strand to resynthesize the correct sequence. Let's now break down what happens when both strands of the double helix are damaged at the same time, which is called a double strand break. This is really dangerous because it can lead to the fragmentation of chromosomes and the possible loss of genes, which is why this type of damage is difficult to repair because if a double strand break happens and these broken pieces become separated, we don't have a backup copy to create the missing information. This is why you always double save your work and make multiple backups, okay? However, cells are geniuses. Of course, they have repair mechanisms to face this kind of problem. 
brilliant. One repair mechanism, which is considered the risky strategy, is called non-homologous end joining. This is where the cell quickly sticks the broken ends back together before the DNA pieces separate from each other and get lost. This involves a specialized group of enzymes that rejoin the ends by DNA ligation. So what happens is a nuclease enzyme first cleans the broken ends and then sticks the clean ends together with a DNA ligase. This rapid mechanism often results in nucleotides being lost at the site of repair because the enzymes just quickly stick the ends together. So right here, we have a loss of nucleotides at the repair site. Now, the other repair mechanism that is way more effective and doesn't cause loss of nucleotides is called homologous recombination. Let's go through this. If a double strand break occurs in a double helix after the DNA has been replicated, the undamaged copy can be used as a template to guide the repair of both broken strands of DNA. So we can use the information on the undamaged strands of the intact double helix to recreate the complementary strands in the broken DNA. This is why it's called homologous recombination because the two DNA molecules are homologous. They have the same or nearly the same nucleotide sequences outside the broken area. Now, this is an error-free mechanism, so we're not losing any genetic information, but how does this exactly occur? Let's break this down. A recombination specific nuclease chews back the five prime ends of the two broken strands at the break. Okay, then one of the broken three prime ends invades the unbroken homologous DNA and searches for a complementary sequence via base pairing with the help of specialized enzyme called RAD52 in eukaryotes. And after the match is made, the invading strand is elongated by repair DNA polymerase using the complementary undamaged strand as a template. After the repair polymerase has passed the point where the break occurred, the newly elongated strand rejoins its original partner, forming base pairs that hold the two strands of the broken double helix together. All right, and then we complete the repair via DNA synthesis at the three prime ends of both strands of the broken double helix, and then DNA ligation happens. Our end result is we have two intact DNA helices. Wow, okay. Now, homologous recombination can also be used to repair other types of DNA damage. And if you recall, it's also involved in the exchange of genetic information during the formation of sperm and eggs in meiosis. We covered this in the reproduction lectures. We've touched on several repair mechanisms, but what happens if DNA repair fails? Permanent changes in the DNA sequence can have severe consequences for an organism. It can change the amino acid sequence of a protein in a way that reduces or even eliminates its ability to function. So for example, mutation of a single nucleotide in the human hemoglobin gene can cause the disease sickle cell anemia. The hemoglobin protein is used to transport oxygen in the blood. Mutations in the hemoglobin gene can produce a protein that is less soluble and produces the sickle shape, the sickle shape of affected red blood cells. These cells tear as they travel through the bloodstream, and so patients with this disease are anemic. They have fewer red blood cells than normal. Okay? Now, before we end this lecture, let's do a quick recap on what we've just covered. Let's do a quick recap on DNA repair. So Rare copying mistakes occur when they aren't detected by the proofreading process. Mismatch repair proteins fix this issue. Now, chemical reactions can damage one of the two DNA strands, and this is repaired by a variety of DNA repair enzymes that detect damaged DNA. And they remove a short stretch of the damaged strand, and then the missing DNA is resynthesized by repair DNA polymerase using the undamaged strand as a template. Now, if both DNA strands are broken, the double strand break can be quickly repaired by non-homologous end joining, but this often leads to nucleotides being lost in the process. This is a risky strategy. And so the cell uses an error-free mechanism called homologous recombination to repair the double strand break by using an undamaged homologous double helix as a template.
So DNA repair processes are important in protecting ourselves from mutations that can have severe consequences. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!